What is up, Charles Lamb? Nothing much, man. Just, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember that we skated in SF with Lucas and stuff. Yeah, absolutely, man. That was a legendary day. <laughs> Yo, you so brought me to that. Uh, you brought me to that Vietnamese spot and then that that burrito spot. Yo, that, that was that. Those SF yeah, bur sure. burritos, they hit different. No, definitely. Whenever, whenever someone from New York comes to town, I try to show them the SF that I kind of figured out, like after being here for five years versus like just going to the island or just going to EMB and kind of being stuck in one place. So that day we definitely like covered some ground. It was definitely um, a full length, full length feature that day. Yeah, absolutely, man. That was an amazing time. I want to go back to SF. Those hills are oh man the, especially the route that you were showing us and they you just have a ton in a row it's it's crazy man it's like it's like skating in no other place i've been to how did you initially start skateboarding um so yeah i lived on a a slight hill and up the block for me about four blocks away there was two high schools and all the dudes that skated there was like this little clique and they would skate to some guy's house that was near me that had some little ramp setups. And they'd always cruise down my hill because that was like the path to that, um, that guy's house. And you just heard the wheels, you know, they're loud. So I was a kid that never skated before and I'd be on like my front porch or on the sidewalk or something and I would just see them and they were just, just killing it, just ollieing garbage cans going down the street. And once I started seeing that, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. How did that dude do that? I'm like, I have to learn this. And um, funny enough, ended up skating with those guys and that kind of molded me into, you know, obviously more than just skating, like music and stuff like that. But um, that's, those were my kind of teachers. And um, I just stuck with them. So when I first started, when, you know, after I learned to Ollie, I was skating with these guys, they're all, 18, 19, like go, about to go to college or something, you know, um, or just work or whatever. They were, they were leaving high school at this point. So I was just hanging out with kind of older dudes. And then I snuck to the city a few times with them. And that's what really opened up like, okay, we went to these skate shops. There's a contest in front of this shop, Benji's, um, which was right near the banks. And we would just, there'd be banks contest. And I would meet people from Jersey, Connecticut, Queens, Brooklyn, you know, uptown. Bronx um, and then that's when the world really grew and I had more friends elsewhere than on Staten Island so I just I couldn't stop I like I couldn't be like contained I just would go to all these places all the time but again that goes back to the trekking like go, going to Flushing Queens and then going back to Staten Island like that that's the whole day you know but um that's eventually what I was doing but yeah back to the question those guys definitely molded me and it just came from seeing them cruised down the hill and once this guy, his name is Khalil, he ollied over a garbage can, like a tall one that happened to be kind of in the middle of the street, just going down the hill super fast and just cleared it. Once I saw that, I was like, all right, this is done. Like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, you know, skating can really opens the doors to a lot of people to so many different things. Like you said, from, from music to just like your understanding of the world, you travel the world because you want to go skate these spots and you learn so many things about other cultures because you go in there. Or I used to watch like, like if uh, Stay Gold or uh, DVS Skate More or Fully Flared or whatever would come out or like um, uh, It's Time, like the Circa It's Time video. Yeah. From, from, the, from the music that they would skate to, you just look into that artist before you know it, your iTunes is just huge and you're collecting all these CDs and it's honestly an amazing thing, bro. And yeah, the, one of the first times that I, so I got I went to like um, Flushing Meadows Park and I saw like I straight up couldn't do anything. And I, I rolled up because just because I had saw the spot in videos. So I was like, let me go there. And I went and there happened to be a session going down. And I remember seeing this kid ollie over a trash can, uh, the cylindrical ones. But it was it was uh, it wasn't standing up. It was like, yeah, they laid it down and he ollied over it. Well, I saw him rolling up to it. And I'm like, well, there's no way he's going to ollie over it because if that was the case, he'd be a pro. That was, that was my thought. And yeah, yeah. I, I saw him Ollie over and I'm like, yo, I was like, I hope one day somehow, somehow I'll be able to do that. And then I was like, well, he's probably the only one in the whole crew who could do that. Next one came over and like cake flipped. I'm like, bro. Yeah. It's crazy, man. The progression and just seeing that world around you when it's brand new to you. And like, 
it's I'm still that kid right there. Like I'm still what you just explained. Like I fully pictured it, especially it being flushing. Like I can see that happening. And like you mentioned someone like, you know, the next thing is in progression is doing a kickflip afterwards. And it kind of taught the influence I got from just watching skating is like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was setting all these short term goals and then piece by piece kind of meeting them. And then you have, you know, a year, then a year and a half into it, you've got, you have a little arsenal of tricks or, you know, you can ollie up certain height curbs or benches, or, you know, you got kick flips, shove it's and heel flips. And like, that's a good little, you know, uh, bunch of tricks to have in your quiver, so to speak, you know, and then it just keeps going. It never ends. Like it's, you know, I'm 40 dude. And I'm still, still kind of going, you know? So it's just, it's one of those, activities that just keeps on going super For sure man do you, do you think that uh as you grow older your skating style is forced to change um i don't i don't know i'm kind of going through like you know i mentioned um a while ago just the last two years we've been cruising hills a lot like because that was new and super insane and so fun to me so i kind of even though i don't ride you know an eight, seven, five, nine inch board. I'm still kind of that guy for a little bit. Just, I was just following what the groups of people were doing. And sometimes it'd be just a few of us, or sometimes it'd be like 15 and all of them were super fun. And it just makes it like a crazy fun day that you can't have anywhere else, but in SF. But now that I've left the city and I'm kind of like in the suburbs skating the Oakland courthouse, which is basically kind of like a Euro, a mini Euro plaza, you know, um, or like a little piece of that plaza in Milan. It kind of like resembles, it's a good granite, smooth ground, multiple ledge options. Um, once I've been, once I started skating there and that's been about three or four months, now that's all I want to do is just go back into ledge skating, get all my tech tricks back if I can, kind of just like explore what happens there for a while. So that's a change, but Overall, I think I've kind of been the same skater my whole life. I haven't like switched up to anything too wild or crazy. I stay within my comfort zone. I'd say it now. Yeah, you're. Uh, how did these tricks that you have pretty much dialed come about? Like you got the switch heel back five zero, not only front heel switch crook, and like I feel like you have just, you have those just every try, man. How did how did you end up doing those as opposed to like other random tricks? You know. Um. I've always had nollie front heels and there was a point where like probably now too, but like I can do that over a can on its side because a it's way easier, but like I could do that over a can on its side earlier than I'll do a kickflip. Like if I kickflip a can on its side, I would be so hyped, but a nollie front heel over the can, like I'm expecting myself to do it because I've just had that trick since I was, I don't know, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to, you know, the tech era of skating, which I love, um, which I guess we're still in because everyone's so, so good at flipping out and all this stuff. But um, I just try to like see what I could bring to the table. Um, you know, obviously you learn kickflip no slide is like your first kind of tech-ish tri uh, trick. Um, and then eventually I just learned nollie heel tails because it was right there and pretty achievable. Um, and if you get the timing right, you can definitely do them every go. And then turning it to crook, that came a little bit later as I started doing more like switch crook grinds and just learning more grinds in general. Um, and you just basically, I just think of it like this, do the tricks, that you, the flip tricks that you know you can pop well and you can pop them tall those should be the first tricks you want to do into a slider or a grind. So to answer the question, that's, that's the only reason I can do that trick because I know I can get it off the ground. Like kickflip no slide is so hard to me now or like kickflip crooks. If you see me try it, like I'm trying really hard. You ever done um, like a nolly front heel into switch 50? On accident, never rode away, but like, yeah. Doing this is right the there, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I want to do it to 5 and kind of bring it to that. That would be sick. Yeah, that would I've be I've done it nuts. to switch front 5-0, though. No, even switch front 5 
Like Nolly that's, front heel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's nuts, man. That's nuts. Uh, or like you had this this one trick that I'd see you do. I don't even know what it was on video though. You, it was like some crazy flat ground trick. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's that's a Sabu flip. So what is that? It's a uh, Nolly inward heel big spin. Every, a lot of people have it, but I guess way back in the days I did one in a video and um, yeah, people started calling it the Sabu flip and that's because Stevie called it that. Stevie Williams was doing them at Love Park at the time, and that's what he called it. Okay. In terms of working in skateboarding, you've been, I feel like you've been working in skateboarding for a while. What was your first skate related job? First skate related job was teaching skating at Chelsea Piers, um, which was super sick. It turned into like, you know, doing private lessons for, I think at the time it was $60 an hour, which is like great for a 19 year old, 20 year old. Um, so you try to rack those up and then they did these like seasonal summer camps. Um, they were pretty draining cause you're on the pier all day in the sun. Also the sun's reflecting off the water. So like those would be long days of summer camps, but you're basically, you can't complain. You're teaching skating. You're at a skate park every day you're making money, you're fed. And when work is done at like three or four, you're right smack in Chelsea, everything, you can do whatever you want, go skate afterwards, go chill. Um, I lived downtown at the time, so I had an easy cross town commute. Um, so that was a good time. But then working, I guess you consider working at Supreme, um, I guess in the industry, but not really, but like definitely, you know, that's a beacon of the skate world. So I guess that you can categorize it that way, but, you know, I spent a long time there. So, you know, a lot of just the skate, um, you know, personalities that I know now, a lot of them came from that. Yeah. How did that come about? I was riding for Supreme for a, a couple of years. Like, you know, also during the time that I worked at Chelsea Piers, um, I was in school at Hunter. So, um, I'd be in school part-time, working part-time at the piers, trying to get other winter jobs when the park was closed. And um, I was doing that for a good two years and hanging out regularly regularly at the, um, at the Supreme store. And those guys just kind of became, you know, it's like anything else, they become your family members. So, you know, there's one day I was out interviewing um, for some jobs during the winter and I sat in the back of the shop and chilled after um, like two of them one day and I just spoke with um, Giovanni Estevez and he and I were cool back in the days. And um, he just mentioned to James that um, I was looking for a job and that, you know, he knows me well, he, he felt like he could trust me. So it kind of just started there. Yeah. And back in the day, I've seen, I've only seen footage, you know, of people lighting off fireworks in front of the, in front of the shop, mad kids just chilling out there skating just kind of like pandemonium sometimes and so different from from what the Lafayette shop was before they moved how, how was what was like some of the stuff you'd see chilling out there um I mean before all the before I worked there it was full-on just like the dudes you would see in like you know the kids movie basically and all the New York guys and like just everyone from everywhere meeting up there to skate flat out front and then figure out what they're doing for the rest of the day um, or the staff just taking turns and like skating out front, you know, Alex Corcoran would be out there with a margarita. Um, you know, it was just downtown, early downtown, like, I don't know, before Soho really was a shopping mall that it is now. Um, there was a bunch of like art studios. There was a lot of antique stores on that block. It was kind of just like a nameless block Lafayette at the time. Um, Fast forward to when I worked there, the, hype's, the hype was there. The hype had already started. So the first day I worked there, there was lines. You know what I mean? So I just got blasted into that world of the hype beast and the lines and the, you know, the greed from some of that, but it's all good. Um, yeah, I don't know. One of the craziest things, I think, a, a couple of years into it was, um, I guess there was a sneaker release. I want to say it was like uh, the Supreme foam posits that looked like 
um it had like a weird like gucci flag kind of graphic on it you know what i'm talking about yeah um, yeah it, it came out with the shorts and stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was those or another Nike shoe where there was kids walking up the street. And I think one of them got hit by a car on Lafayette. And I think they had the shoe stolen when they got hit by a car, whether it was on purpose or not. Like, I'm not really too sure, but that happened. You know, there'd be things like kids smoking, you know, dust on the line, waiting overnight online. And then you open the store and they're like zombies in the store. Um, there was, you know, one or two fights. They were actually pretty tame considering we didn't have security guards like all the Supreme stores do now every day. We had to, I had to get, you know, Matt Perez and his little buddies help with the trash. And we had to get, you know, hired, you know, people that we knew from nightclubs and stuff like that to do the door eventually like it, it bubbled up into what it is now definitely during that era um yeah just you know random random street stuff you would see in front of there you know would you consider those like your golden days do you ever look back and wish you were still a part of those times because even like a life we talked to this dude just that run they used to run that place and um you know, and uh, he's Rob just, yeah, he, he talked yeah, about the right. culture and all the graffiti writers that would come about all the skaters. It was just so popping. But nowadays, you know, like not only, you know, places like that, just in general, there's less life in the city. You ever reminisce on those times and wish like you could go back to that? I don't know if I, if I wish going back to it um, in the way things were exactly then is, I don't know, I, I guess I just have an older point of view to always kind of go forward and, and not go back. But that was definitely a golden era, man. That was that was some of the best times of my life. I mean, a lot of the characters that were there aren't, aren't with us anymore, you know? So I got to see them and that was pretty dope and special and like chilling with Harold and stuff like that. Like that was sick, he's hilarious. Um, so there's a lot of that portion to it. That's, you know, that's definitely missing now. Um, but, you know, it was a time where I was super, I'm, I'm going to admit, I was young and reckless. Like, we kind of had it, we had it made. You know, I started, you know, partying a lot. Um, I was paying 500 bucks rent. I didn't, nothing really mattered. You know what I mean? I was right there. I lived near Max Fish. I could walk home from Max Fish. So, winters, everyone was there a lot. Um, you know, you go other places and everyone knows you. You get hooked up with food. That gets pretty spoiling. You keep milking that, you know, you just, it's from one place to another. Um, but you know, that, that stuff gets old, dude, you know, um, there's definitely more to life than party for sure. Yeah. Uh, when, when you were working at Supreme, did they have the, the security guards already? Did anyone try to rob the shop or anything like that? No, there was no security guards and there's only one instance where someone ran in and like, open armed, grabbed a whole rack of, of gear from the front and just ran out. Like they grabbed the displays of whatever was hanging there. And Ryan Hickey got the baseball bat from, out, uh, from behind the counter and chased this dude for as long as he could. It was, it was four o'clock in like December. So it was, it was already pitch black out and um, he chased him for as far as he could. Eventually, the guy just outran Hickey. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was the only time there was really a robbery. And during that time period, the Lafayette Street wasn't anything like it was now. It wasn't now you got like Carhar, you got like all these shops on that on that block. No, nah, there was just um, there was just uh, an evolution of stores right next door to it before it eventually became the coffee place, Cologne. Mm -hmm. um, and like a bunch of random there's a shoe store across the street why do you think that like this brand popped off like even when you first started working there it just popped off crazy like that the way i saw it when i was younger and you know before i worked there is that it had a huge appeal uh, appeal to uh japanese culture so i saw that as something that no one else had um, and the way they, they kind of, um, in a way, idolize Western culture, especially when it comes to un underground lifestyle stuff like skating and everything that comes with that. Um, so I saw that success there. And, you know, they already had five or six stores in Japan 
at that time. So I kind of saw it as not really like a streetwear thing, but more for a Japanese consumer that's more into like smart looking clothing and more military influenced clothing. Like that's really what I saw it as. And then the skaters wore it in a way that made it look kind of cool and streetwear because they would oversize everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but the logo and I think the smart non-marketing of never having an ad and it being something kind of spoken about only and if you know, you know, kind of thing. Um, that's what it was back in the day. So, you know, they get, they basically, James started the limited, um, only put out certain quantities of stuff and, you know, it all, it all worked. Um, and it was smart designs. Like, you know, I don't want to discredit the product and the vision. Like it was really smart stuff at the time. Um, it was sick. I mean, there was books, there was art collaborations, all the cool accessories that that's been going on forever. Um, I mean, the first boards that I saw that were made for the shop were, I, I guess they were made by girl. So China would. Um, so that showed me that those guys were cool with the girl dudes. And then the next day I go to the store and I see like Keen in there, you know, like saying what's up with everyone and chilling. And it was kind of like, oh man, this is crazy. Uh, but it just had its own like, you know, clothing stores were like the Gap and Old Navy and stuff like that to me. Um, and, you know, random stores on Broadway where you go to Supreme and it was like, it was definitely a lifestyle. So I think that was the change, um, I guess, for people to be like super into it, you know? What was the the point when you stuck? How long did you work for them and what made you stop? Um, I worked there for nine years and... Honestly, um, I, I didn't leave on any bad blood and I love all those guys and it was an amazing opportunity. Um, and I've got nothing bad to say and I've got, only got amazing things to say about the experience there. Um, but I just really internally, all my friends that were my peers from school and people that didn't skate that I hung out with, they all had these other careers and stuff that they worked towards Whereas I kind of stayed at the same place for a long time and I felt like I wasn't building any other skills. And I know, you know, you can go to class at night and all this stuff, but I kind of wanted to take a break and figure out what I wanted to do next because I didn't really have the headspace when you're dealing with customers all day. And especially at the volume of which that place gets and what it got at, by the time I left, I mean, it was psycho, man. It was every day there was a line and it, it still is like that, but um, you don't really have the headspace. And I guess I just didn't take time off, you know, like I didn't take enough time off <laughs> in hindsight. I should have taken like four weeks if I could have, but um, I just felt like I wasn't building any other skills. And I saw my peers having all these other work skills or, hey, now this guy's working for a bank and getting X amount of cash a year. And I was like, whoa, man, like it was kind of like a, a realization of I can keep doing this. This is great. I have it made. This is amazing. This is safe and secure, or I can risk it, figure out what I want to do and kind of pursue something else with a new skill plus the knowledge I have already from running a business. So that kind of propelled me to leave. And where did so. you go from there? Well, it was, it was a long road to getting a job because I didn't get another full-time job until I moved to California. And that was a year and a half later. Um, I did some set design jobs that a lot of skaters do or just doing PA work on photo shoots. That was cool to learn, but those days are really long. Like you're getting, you know, you get there in the morning, you're not leaving until 11 midnight and they don't pay well. So it, that was another like kind of smack in the face like oh man what did I do like now I'm doing this this is so labor intensive and the hours are crazy long I'm too exhausted to do anything on my day off but you know I did that for a little while um and then I did like I helped my buddy with a little marketing thing that was for like labor um and Nike SB uh they did like a little activation space that was near labor um did that for a couple of weeks. And then, and then after that, it was basically the conversation between my wife and I about moving. And it took a while 
to start the process of the move, go back and forth to SF. And then I told you I had that, I met that, um, I saw my homie Adam in SF and he introduced me to Levi's and he was leaving. He wanted me to kind of take over his job. And he was working on the skate apparel and the skate team and stuff like that. And I was like, dude, that's so right up my alley. I could learn from this, but also I have enough to bring to the table. I know how this works. So, and it was really involved, like, right. My first fast forward, I did get the job at Levi's, which was awesome. And one of my first weeks there, I went on a trip with the skate team and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So I met Marius and all those dudes, um, Plunkett and um, Al Parts, and it was sick. Um, and then I realized what I needed to learn to do that job because I kind of just got in off of like knowing this guy and having kind of like an extensive resume, but I didn't really, I wasn't an Excel jockey yet. And I didn't use, I didn't have like um, really brushed up office skills. So, and that's something I learned on that job and can do it well now. So I'm super grateful for that. You still there right now? I actually got laid off due to coronavirus two months ago. So I was there for almost five years. Um, I was actually happy that it happened. I needed a break. We moved. Um, I moved my mom here. That's been a big thing. So actually I'm, I'm super fortunate to have the free time now to be able to like take care of all this other stuff. <clears throat> How often are you skating now? Uh, every other day, <laughs> at least, you know, it's easy now. Like going skating now, isn't a whole day. Maybe it's going for two hours. Maybe it's doing something in the morning, you know, like if that's the case, then I, I skate almost every day, but full set skate days that are like three plus hours like that's probably every other day and what's your uh what's your day-to-day -day like now living in uh oakland um well my, my wife is a real estate developer and interior designer so i'm in my house now I, my camera's not working so i'm not going to show you but it's still basically under construction and has been for two months so we've actually been moving around and couch surfing um we stayed at her sister's we stayed at her dad's we stayed at an airbnb i'm at a hotel right now overnight because there's um paper everywhere and workers in the backyard they have to paint everything they knock down a wall they have to reconstruct that put in a steel beam there's a lot of stuff that's like not done yet so the house isn't really livable at the moment um so that, to answer the question, my day-to-day -day is nothing regular right now because I'm in the car driving from whatever new location I'm at. Um, so it's been a little bit exhausting, but what I ideally, what I think when we move back into the house full-time, I think my day-to-day -day is go and see my mom in the morning or early like noon, grab lunch, chill, kick it with her for a little bit, catch up. Um, spend another two hours doing whatever chores have to be done. Um, you know, with moving, there's like so many, so many parts, like new bank, new doctors, new um, everything. Um, so I'm still in the midst of taking care of all that stuff. So I'll dedicate some, some time to that. And then around 4 p.m., I'll go skate the courthouse and until like 7 p.m. and come home and eat. And that's the end of the day. So you said you moved your mom out there? Yep. That's what's up. She was living in New York before? Yeah, she was on the Upper West Side. And, um, you know, she's getting older. So it was just, I felt like it was pretty unsafe with the winter. And, and then the virus got crazy. You know, New York was the capital of the virus for so long, especially in the beginning. And, you know, the group that succumbs to the virus the hardest are the elderly. So I was just worried, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not only the virus, man, there's a lot of violence and stuff happening. A lot of people are moving out that can do it, you know what I mean? And the people staying here are kind of, you know, they don't have the opportunity to do that. And, you know, a lot of people are desperate. They haven't been working. They've been out of work for so long and the funds are low and people are resorting to crazy things, you know, and it's going to take a while for it to come back. So it's a good thing that she can't, she's out there. You know, I wish I could take my mom to somewhere more quiet, you know? For sure. Dude, that's exactly what I was thinking too. Like all the protests too, when she moved it was right when they were popping and I was like, Oh my God, if she even sets foot outside, like who knows 
what's going to happen. So now she's like, it took a while, you know, she's been in, in this, in New York for 50 years. That's an even tougher transition for someone like that. <laughs> but now she's like really enjoying California. It's nice and calm where she lives. It's the suburbs. There's beautiful parks. It's like nice and easy. So definitely thankful. It took a lot of work, but I'm definitely thankful that she's out here for sure. It's amazing, bro. I feel like, I feel like, yeah, it's something so important that as, as parents grow older to have them close by. Another thing too, is like, you know, having her move out to California and everything's different. She's been living in New York for 50 years. That change, I feel like it pumps some sort of life into you because you have things to look forward to, or you have like adjust adjustments to make and just you know, it's like a real life, a real life happening and stuff like that. Couldn't agree more. I, I definitely see that change. Um, I'll just disclose to you that my mom's got Alzheimer's. So, mm-hmm. you know, that seeing any kind of change with someone in that condition is like seeing that change times a million in us with where we're at mentally, you know? So I'm noticing that exact change now, like it took her a while to come around, but she's really starting to enjoy it. And, um, it's just like safer and yeah, dude, like the, the feeling that I get from that is, you know, I can just be relaxed. Um, New York is tense, man. I don't hate it. Like I wish if things were normal, I'd be going back and visiting all the time, dude. Like hang out with homies, see the old spots, skate the new spots, just chill for a week. You know, the convenience of it, the city's so fun going to skate spots like Flushing. Um, you know, I miss all that. Trust me. But I'm just going to say my opinion now, after being here for the length of time that I've been, it's, it's just kind of a better life. That's what, that's what a lot of people say, you know, the sometimes, especially depending on your situation, the quality of life in New York can get really hectic. Like, you know, it's one thing to live downtown and be there. It's another thing to live two or three hours away from everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, it becomes like the smallest thing can become a daily, a whole day. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing about the Bay Area, too, that attracted us was, you know, it's, it's not as convenient as New York. Obviously, nothing can be, but you're not driving all day like you are in L.A. Like, things are close here. Mm-hmm. Things, are re- things are 20 minutes tops away. Like, that's, that's not a long time to be in the car. That's not a pain in the ass, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's really agreeable that way versus L.A. You know, I, I can't do that traffic. That's... I don't like being in the car that long. So yeah, I remember when I remember when I was in SF, I feel like I was just getting everywhere in two seconds, like a two second hill bomb or you, and then you just take the the trolley up again and you're just everywhere in in two seconds. Yeah. It's, it's so easy. It's especially skating in SF between, yeah, exactly. Like linking the Hills between the bus routes, like the bus, you'd never wait more than five minutes for it. Like, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty ideal. How did you figure out the, the, the hill routes that you have out on SF? Um, just, just from the people that have already been doing it. Um, yeah, they're all, I mean, there's some I haven't done. There's some that, dude, I've definitely gotten um, smoked on a couple of hills before. Uh, I've, I've slammed into cars while going down a hill. That's, I don't slam like speed wobble and then fall. Thank God that hasn't happened yet, but... I've slammed into cars like three times. Like what you do? Will you T-bone them? Or what do you mean? Like parked cars on a really tight turn that you're going so fast, you know, you're not going to make the turn. That's happened. That exact thing has happened. So many, I took off a, um, the rear view mirror of the, on the driver's side of a big van and they have like slightly bigger mirrors than like a sedan. We're all mobbing down this hill. It's called Terracita. I don't know if I did that with you guys. Maybe I did, but um, I slammed into it and I just like, my body is like upside down and I just see plastic everywhere in the air and I fall on the ground. Thank goodness nothing got broken or I didn't rip any skin open or whatever, but behind me is like a bunch of shrapnel and the um, rear view mirror. And then um, my friend Pizzle picked it up the next time we went down and gave it to me, it's hilarious. Yo, but, uh, that is that is nuts, man. The, I didn't before I went out there. I didn't know that it. I wouldn't say it's frowned upon, but people out there try not to. It's like cooler if you don't power slide when you go down those hills. Yeah, is, it's it's a it's a thing, you know. People 
you'll see it. I don't, I'm not even going to say it's anyone that's doing that. I mean, you just go to Twin Peaks and people spray paint it on the ground. No slides. That is, <laughs> yo, that is crazy. I remember you spray paint it on the, on the ground. It's like, it's, it's pretty sick. And people do it more power to them. Like I've yeah. only one, one or two routes that I was able to do no slides. And it's not, I mean, I guess Twin Peaks doesn't even count, but like, you don't have to slide on that. Um, I mean, it's for me coming from somewhere where there's not that many hills. It's hill after hill after hill. You start, at least I start questioning. All right, well, what happens at the end? You know, what happens if, especially if I'm not sliding, what what is the end result of this? A car is going to come out of nowhere. That's, you know, at that moment, you got to make a decision. You know, and it's like, is this is this the lifestyle you chose, or are you going to slide and make it out of this one in one piece? You know. <laughs> Me personally, I gotta be, it's not about me anymore. It's about my mom here, my wife, you know what I mean? Like, so I can't really, I can't, I can't get hurt like that. You know, I'm too you ever, you ever seen any gnarly slam skating with uh, your homies and stuff? Nope. My homie got a concussion right in front of me. I had to go to the hospital with him. Going down the same street, Corbett, that I took you on. Mm -hmm. um, that was not cool at all. Um, I've seen others, but that's like the most like gruesome one that happened in front of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of the, you know, it's crazy, man. The, when people push down those and then yo GX filming with a, with a, with a fish eye lens down those, it makes no sense. It's yeah, crazy. That's, that's what those guys do. He's, he's good at it. Like that's, that's his comfort zone. So he's able to do it. You know, he gotta be so on point to do that, man. It's, it's, crazy it's honestly very impressive when i watch the footage I, sometimes i'm not even paying attention to the trick i'm i'm just thinking yo this dude is filming squatted making sure that he's not head cutting all this stuff while doing this it's crazy yeah it's a, it's definitely a talent um for him and there's a lot of other dudes that film down down these hills too um i don't know all of them but you know i see the videos mm -hmm. you know people are going for it right now out here a lot you think you're you're in oakland to stay or you're gonna go back to sf um, we're probably here for to stay like we wanted a backyard and you know especially during the pandemic being locked down trust me we had we had a pretty nice place in SF but it was a second floor in a two-family house and there was no backyard and it was just kind of feeling like man I want to like you know just stretch a little bit and like not not be confined and we just started looking and we just it, we didn't plan on moving out here it just kind of happened um now we got a backyard. I got, I'm biking a lot. Um, yeah, it's super nice. It's amazing to hear, bro. Um, I'm hoping that whenever I go out there again, I, I, I've been wanting to, but you know, with all this stuff going on, but Lucas and I definitely want to go. I've been vowing. We planned on going like three months after mm -hmm. our initial trip. Cause I was just thinking this is amazing. These hills are sick. It like rein, it reinvigorates my, my skateboarding. But, you know, life gets in the way. But if I ever go out there again, I'm hoping to be able to skate with you and stuff. Oh, for sure. Definitely let me know. Hit me up. We'll, you know, come out to Oakland. That's a whole other thing you haven't even seen yet, you know? Yeah, so. for sure. 100%, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us on the show, bro. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, man. It was a pleasure. For sure. Hell yeah. Appreciate Peace, it. Peace, bro. Stay safe. Charles Lim. All right. You too.